Okay, yesterday we finished the second parak in Sefer Shoft and we kind of brushed it up right at the end. Just one last point to uh, parak base I wanted to raise. That was in Puzzle Chof Base. So Hashem says, measure for measure, you didn't want to drive out the Canaanites, you did the things you weren't supposed to do. So I'm going to leave over Canaanites. You won't be able to drive them out so that they will test them. So in Pesach Hafez it says, I'm going to leave them there to test you. If the people, the Jewish people, will protect the Derech Hashem, to go in them. Which their fathers kept or not. What's the grammatical problem? The grammatical problem, it should say, Hashem Ba. Ba. To go in the derech. A derech is singular. Okay? To go in the derech Hashem Loleches. Ba. Bo. The singular, not bum. Bum is a plural. So one one shot you could say is well, you know, there's many possible ways to reach Hashem, and and ev- I want to see which one of the possible ways could you maybe serve Hashem. At the end of the day, they didn't serve Hashem in any of the possible ways. So that's one way to look at it. But the truth is, Rav Tzadok Hakohen he talks about this in Parshas Mase. Bum, the word bum, has a numerical value of 42. Now, 42 is a very big Kabbalistic number, which we're not going to get into. But there's, there's a name of Hashem that's related uh, to the number 42. So, Rav Tzadik explains, where is 42 a number that we're familiar with? There's only one place in the Torah where 42 is a big number. And that's what? The Jewish people, when they traveled through the desert, they had 42 places where they stopped. 42 places. So, what is the idea of the 42 places? So, so Rabbi Sadiq says, this has to do with the, with the name of Hashem that has to do with 42. And he says, he says, that, that mystical name of Hashem relating to the number 42, that's the name that Kabbalists would use to help them ascend to higher spiritual realms. They would use the 42 letter name of Hashem. Okay, that's beyond what, what we can handle. But then he explains the idea of all the travels that the Jews had in the desert. He says, we know when the Jews will travel, the famous puzzle, they traveled by the ark. The ark went first and the Jews followed. And that's what we say whenever we take out the Torah. So what do we say? When the ark would travel, we'd say, Hashem, get up, Hashem. Spread out uh, your enemy, push him away. So the way we translate it, not necessarily correctly, is and your enemies will run away from before you. So, in other words, every time they got up and traveled, their enemies would run away from before them. There's only one problem. When they were in the desert, there weren't any enemies there. It's not like, you know, we're not talking, we're not talking about the battles in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, that could be. But this was in the desert. That's, that's what Moshe by He ben Saron by Yom Moshe. So what did Moshe have to say? What enemies were we were we pushing around? Spiritual So he's talking not the enemies, uh, the the, not, the non-Jewish nations, but rather he says, Ach perish misanecha hamasmi Hashem isparch beini Yisrael. They do things to cause Hashem to hate the Jewish people. Masniye means, means the one who caused hatred, cause hatred, not hate, cause hatred. And that is the Yetzirah. 
That's the Yetzirah. So therefore, the idea of the traveling, the real enemy is the Yetzirah. And he causes the Jewish people to be hated. So our traveling, Rav Tzadok says, Tanasiya Hoyalihi Natsal Ma Yetzirah. The traveling was to travel away from the Yetzirah and rather come to the Yetzir Tov. And the truth is, that's really what a person's whole life is. It's one journey. It's a journey to always being able to, to push away the Yetzirah from themselves. The Yetzirah should, want to, should run away from us. So that, we could say then, makes a little bit more mystical understanding of the Pasuk here, where it said in Pasuk of Beis, to test the Jewish people if they will guard the derech Hashem, the way of Hashem. Now we're talking about a, a journey, right? That what? The leches bum, to go in them. Bum means the 42 letters, the 42 journeys. Everybody in one mystical sense or another has, has his own 42 journeys. And each journey is supposed to push away the eight Sahara. Every has, has certain, certain periods in your life uh, how long that period of your life can be, who knows. But that's the whole idea when you went, they went in the desert. They camped in a certain area, didn't know how long they were going to stay there, and then you'd move on. You'd move on to a different part, part of the desert, and then you'd stop there. So we all have certain journeys that we take, and many, many journeys, and the whole point of the journeys is to push the eight of our way. And the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael have no less of a journey to make than the people who are in the desert. So that's what's being hinted, perhaps. Rav Tzadok doesn't say it over here, but bum is the numerical value of 42. So that idea is that will get you closer to Hashem if you take the correct steps in your journey. So that, uh, that uh, could very well be the shot over there. Okay, let's move on now to Per Gimel. And the Malbim says that Perik Gimel, again, the beginning of Perik Gimel is still part of this very long introduction to Sefer Shoftim. And as the end of Perik Bey said, Hashem uh, left over certain non-Jewish nations and didn't allow the Jews to drive them out. And there, there will be a test to the Jews to see if they go in Hashem's way or not. So now we, for the next, I believe it's six Tzukim, Next six psukim, we have to finish up, well, who are these nations that Hashem left over and exactly what, what was going on over there. It's all part of this overall introduction of the recurring theme of Sefer Shoftim. So in Pasuk Aleph, it says, goyim asher Hashem So these are the nations that Hashem left over for, for, the, for that to be a test to the Jewish people. Es Yisrael, for the Jewish people. Es kol asher, very challenging clause over here. So the, the Malvim is, is going to say that Hashem leaves them for two tests, as it were, for two tests. But he's starting saying, Those who did not know the wars of Canaan. Those who did not know the wars of Canaan. So what does it mean, those who did not know the wars of Canaan? So there seems to be different opinions in the Rishonim over here. The commentaries exactly who did not know. So the, the most uh, popular commentary is it's talking, believe it or not, it's talking about, uh, uh, well, really, it, it's some interpret it to be the Jews and some interpret it to be the non-Jews. So, for example, Yosef Karo says, these are the, he's talking about the nations who didn't know about, the Goyish nation who didn't know about the wars of Yeshua. In other words, nations who didn't know about the wars of Yeshua, they're pretty scared. They remember what it was like when Yeshua did all the miracles that was going on there. So that could put a fright into them. But he's saying, you know, it could be Ace Kol Asher Loyoto, the ones who did not know about these wars. So therefore, they were not afraid of the Jewish people. Uh, they weren't aware of that. Uh, other Mephorshim seem to say, it's referring to the Jewish people, that they did not know the wars of Canaan, and they didn't see with their eyes the great miracles that was going on. And really, you know, either way you learn it, it's not good for the Jews. 
the Jews didn't see the miraculous things, so you know, how could you ever believe God would ever do such things for us? To cause us to have maybe less faith, the next generation has less faith than the ones who saw. And for the Canaanites, they didn't know, they didn't see it, so they wouldn't be as frightened. So it works negatively on both ways, so probably both shut them are correct. So then why is, so then he, he goes back and says, so what's the point of leaving them? So the Malbim says, the point in the tests, what is the test? There's two aspects of the tests. Two aspects of the tests. So in Pasuk Beis, he gives us the first aspect here. Uh, which is, Rak laman das doras b'nei Yisrael lamda milchama rak asher lafanim lo yadom. So the first explain it means, Rock, meaning this is one of the reasons. One of the reasons is that the, that the next generations of Jews should know how to learn how to fight military battles. Rock asher lafanim loidim, which was not known before. The generations before the Jewish people under Yeshua, they didn't learn how to, they didn't know how to fight battles. They didn't fight battles. It was all miraculous. But this generation, the continued generations, they're going to have to learn the, the tactics of war, real tactics, real war, real training. It's no more just give, give, the, give the guy in call a sword and he just waves it around and so just makes it kill the enemy. No, you've got to practice your archery, you've got to practice place, you've got to practice military tactics, you've got to, basic training. So will, will they do this? in order to drive out the enemy and thereby a number of things are going to happen. First of all, that's a test. Will they learn how to be fighters? Which is not a, usually a Jewish um, skill. Not that, something that Jews are into. So will they, because that's what's going to take to drive out the Canaanites now. It's not going to be miracles. It would have been if the Jews would have done what they were supposed to do and conquered them properly. Now you didn't conquer them properly, they're going to be a pain in the neck for you. And the only way you're going to get them out is by real military war, the real old-fashioned, the real thing. So that, you know, that's just like you're not going to get manna from heaven anymore. You've got to go to the field and farm the field, and, and, and Hashem can and will bless you. So you've got to learn how to fight battles, real battles, and Hashem could bless you if you're following Hashem's path. And you'll also recognize what it meant that miracles happened before. You realize, you know, how much training you've got to do to be a, any kind of a soldier? And they're going to tell you, well, you know, your grandparents never trained. He says, what? They never trained. What do you mean they never trained? They never trained. Why? Oh, sure. Fuck their battles. They'll recognize what kind of miracles really happened, even if you don't see it. In other words, if you can see the miracles, that's one thing. But then if, if you're told, I just want you to know, your great-grandparents, they came into the land of Israel, they conquered most mighty nations, and none of them have done any of the training that you've been doing for the last six months. And none of them had the sophisticated weaponry that you have developed. So that's going to teach them a lesson about what the past was all about and to test to see if they will want to learn how to be fighters, which is not a, a typically Jewish thing, which is a test. Jews by nature are not killers. That's not our nature. Our nature is peace-loving people. We don't derive any pleasure of us making a career out of killing people. A career officer, it's not a Jewish concept, you know. But they're going to have to learn how to do this in order to destroy the enemy. So it's not a pleasant thing. That's a test, so to speak. That's one test. We'll see what the second test is in a minute. Yes, Sammy. Is this Hashem's way of trying to wean us off from dependence upon Him? Because why does He continue to to fight the battles for a while? Why, what, what, uh, why suddenly decide not to? Uh, why no, we did the wrong thing, but that's well, that's part of that's part of the mita kenege mita punishment. But even in the desert, you said they did the wrong things too, because they said the forty-two things that, that stopped. They they didn't listen to Hashem certain no. ways. They, no, no, so no, no, they no. still Hashem still looked after them. How come but, suddenly? Okay, okay so boys, so you're so on your own now. In the desert, it was different because he was taking out of people who were slaves for two hundred and ten years, and you know what? He knew that they're going to have to make mistakes. The little babies, spiritual babies, so. they have to learn how to walk. I have to be with them every step of the way. The truth of the matter is Hashem did not want to let, let, let the Jewish people go in the land of Canaan. But what he, what he wanted was the Jews to live a normal human life. And in the context of a normal human life, Hashem would provide many uh, miracles of nature 
that would just be tremendous blessings. It would, it would be veiled, but anybody with, a, with their eyes open would see this, that Hashem is very close with them. As opposed to in the desert where it was outstanding miracles that you can't argue. Man is falling every day. Water's coming out of a rock. Um, there's clouds of glory protecting you. That is supernatural, which had to be for the 40 years because they needed to understand what it really means that there's a God. But what God ultimately wanted, as we know, God does not, and this is an, was an angelic existence. God does not need angels. He's got enough in heaven. He needs human beings who can live in this physical world the way any other human being lives in a physical world and yet have a tremendous close relationship to Hashem and see Hashem blessing him via what would appear under the cloak of a natural blessing. But obviously anyone with, with, with eyes and can penetrate and realize Hashem is blessing us in incredible ways. Hashem doesn't want, doesn't want to make overt miracles anymore. He wants us to live as people in this world. And you roll up your sleeves and you do what you have to do. But you will see incredible blessings from this. And, there'll be, and when you live this world, there's all kinds of temptations. And you have to overcome those temptations. And then Hashem will bless you. How will He bless you? Every seventh year, your crop will be a bumper crop. Oh, great crop. Your, your stock will go up 300%. Right? It could happen. In fact, it happens every seventh year. It's a very interesting curiosity. Okay? And the fact that the food, you know, miraculously could expand in your stomach and you wouldn't have to eat so much every seventh year. What you had is good enough for three years. Okay, that's still cloaked in nature, but that's what Hashem wants to see happen with us. So similarly, you know, and, and so now Hashem would have uh, enabled the Jews to win the wars without having to learn how to be fighters, had they had more bitach on Hashem. And okay, so you're just waving the, the, the swords. And the enemies would always just be afraid of you. But since you made a lot of mistakes, and so now you're going to have to work a lot harder in the natural realm to make it happen. The more, the more you move away from Hashem, the harder it's going to be for you to work at what you have to do. That, that's part of the quid pro quo. If, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're doing this wrong, it's going to be just harder for you. It's going to be harder for you. You could still recognize it was going to be hard. So that was test number one for them. Continuing, plus the Gimels, who are these nations? They're the Chamesha Sarnay Plishtim. These are the five, uh, uh, five Philistine like governments. How do they translate the word Sarnay? Uh, five governors. Governors, right? The five governors of Plishtim. Now that's interesting. I thought I thought um, Yehuda <coughs> conquered three of them already. Didn't we, didn't we have them conquered? Yes, that's right. In Perak Aleph. It was Kalev. We conquered Hebron. In Perak Aleph, Pasig Yudches. By Yilkod Yehudas Aza, Ashkeloin, and Ekron. Those are three of the five governors. So uh, some of the forces say that, uh, well, he did, but then since the next generation came, people weren't didn't remain strong, and the those governors came back and took back their land, took it away from the Jews. Okay, then you have to start explaining what does it mean that Hashem left them over. So, you could say maybe it's referring to the other two or the other Canaanites. But they were left over, and we see historically in Sefer Shoftim Plishtim were a big thorn in our side. And all the Canaanites and the Tzidonis and the Chivis who lived in the, in the Lebanon, uh, Hare Lebanon, Mehar me, Mehar Bal Chermon Ad Levochamos from the mountain of Chermon until Levochamos. So these were the ones that were left. And what are they there for, Dalit? Again, second point. They're there to test the Jews, Ladas, to know Will they listen to the commandments that was given to them? To the, that was commanded their fathers through Moshe or not. This is the second reason why Hashem is leaving. It's going to be a test. Will they not intermarry with them? Will they not serve their gods or not? Those were the two tests. Those were the two tests. And the Malvim says, and of course, they failed both tests. Plus a cave. Ruben Esau, Yashru Bekerif Haknani, the Jewish people lived amongst the Canaanites, right? 
So therefore, obviously, if they lived amongst them, they didn't bother to learn all the military tactical warfare. They did not drive them out. They lived amongst the Canaanites. And more than that, worse, Pasuk Vav, they failed the second test. The Jewish people took their daughters, Lohem, Lenoshim, for wives. Vespinosem and their daughters, Nasulem, they gave to their sons, the non Jewish sons, Vayavdu as Elohehem, and they served their idols as well. So, again, this is like the full ending of the overall introduction to Sefer Shoft. That's pretty, pretty, pretty sad. It's pretty sad. Okay, so now let's move on. Pasuk Zion. And now we're going to begin to actually get into the specific Shoftim and the specific stories uh, that occurred over here. Okay. So let's begin Pasuk Zion. So now, now, uh, now that we're done with this overall stuff, so now we go back to the actual period of the Shoftim and the period of the first Shofet. The Jewish people did evil in the eyes of Hashem. And they forgot Hashem, their God, and they served the Baal and the Asheros. Now I have a new name of an idol. Getting lots of names of idols. Asheros, we said, was the image of the... Um, no, the Baal, I'm sorry. Baal. Yeah, the Baal, uh, masters, whatever. The Asheros, which Sion says, is Elon Hanevat. It's a tree that was served. Trees, tree. They made idols out of trees. That was a big idol, trees. So they, they worshipped these types of idols. So this is not good. So of course, what happens? Pasuches vayicharaf Hashem biYisrael. Hashem gets angry at the Jewish people. Vayim kareim, and he sold them, as it were, biyad kusham rishosayim, in the hands of a wicked fellow by the name of Kushan. That's his name, Kusham. Rishasayim. What word do you see in Rishasayim? Russia. Russia. A wicked person. What's Rishasayim suggest? A double Russia. A double Russia. We'll see in a minute what's the double Russia over here. But they were put in the hands of Kushim Rishasayim. Now, wait a minute. Now, now, you'd think, okay, where do you think a king that the Jews would be handed over to would be the king? In what area? In Canaan. Not so. The first one is not from Canaan. He's Melech Aram Naharaim. He's the king of Aram Naharaim. Where's Aram Naharaim? Padan Aram. Right? This is where Avram originally came from. That is northeast of Eretz Yisroel. Northeast of the Euphrates River. So that's somewhere in Iraq. Iraq, Iraq. That's where Avram originally came from. That's the home of Besuel, Lavan, and that Chevra. Okay, that Chevra of people. So the, the, the leader of that group of people, his name was Kushan Rishosayim. And, there, and Hashem just gave him over to him. And the Jewish people were servants, were enslaved uh, to Kushan Rishosayim for eight years. So, so the question has to be asked, why is it starting with a foreign power taking us over? So a simple answer could be, well, the Jewish people intermarried with the Canaanites. So, you know, there was a certain period of time where the Canaanites were kind of happy with the arrangement, considering that the original plan was the Jews were supposed to destroy them. <laughs> So the Jew says, okay, you know, we'll let you live here. We'll live peacefully together, Jew and Arab together. We can live peacefully. So that works for a little while because, like, the, the, the Canaanites are kind of relieved that they're not going to get killed. So, okay, and, and they are mishpacha. We're, we're intermarried with each other. So first generation in Germany, I mean, in Canaan, you know, they let you live there and it's okay. All right, they let you live there. So there's no immediate need to kill out the Jews. So that's why there's this little, you know, peace for a while. So, uh, so then, so Hashem has to find somebody to make trouble for us. 
Right? So it makes some trouble for us. Now, that's on a simple level. Now, in the Sefer Parsha of Sifredivim, it's very interesting. He discusses this a little bit. And he explains, he adds, probably the Canaanites were very much still afraid of the Jews because still there were awesome victories Yeshua did. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't so long ago. It was, people remember the awesome victories. And if the Jews are willing to not fight them, they say, okay, let's let that be. But he is picking somebody who is really mishpacha with us. The people from Aram, Aram Narayim, this is the relatives. These are the people that Avram came from, Rivka came from this area, Rachel and Leah came from this area. And what do we know? So there's a very interesting Gomorrah in Sanhedrin. Gomorrah in Sanhedrin says, Tana, who Baor, the person's name is Baor, who Kushan Rishasayim, he is also known as Kushan Rishasayim, who Lavan Harami, is also known as Lavan Harami. Okay, who is Baor? No? Bilam ben Baor. Bilam, the son of Baor. Baor. Why is it called Baor? Baor, because Baor means from the word Bier. Ubier bisteacher. No, Rafal. Ubier bisteacher. Nazikin, Nazikin. When an animal, no, not be'er, be be'er means an animal. So he was, he is involved in bestiality. Okay, that's that's the father of Bilaam. So the, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Okay, so you know, in other words, you know, when you say Boor, you're also including Bilaam because Bilaam comes from Boor. Right? But anyway, so the Gemara seems to say, of course, we have to modify this, is that. Baor, Kusha and Risha Saim, and Lav and Arami were one and the same. Now, technically that's not possible because that would mean from Lavan all the way until Kusha and Risha Saim, you're talking about 500 years. Yeah. So that's not probably what it's all about. But it means it's, 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 it's the root personality. The root personality of Lavan. What do we say every year at the, at the Seder? Lavan bikesh la'akor es hakol. Lavan wanted to totally destroy the Jewish people. When Yaakov was in Lavan's house, he wanted to destroy him. And this, the best way just to get him to assimilate, that's what he had wanted, and if that wouldn't work, he would try to physically kill him. Lavan was no friend of the Jewish people. Right? So therefore, that's the root of the problems. Well, it surfaces again with Bilam, and, okay, you could say his father, Baor, and then Kushan Rishasayim. So now we want to say, why is he named Kushan Rishasayim? Because he did two bad things. One was in the days of Yaakov, because that's the root of his soul is from Lavan. And once in the days of the Shoftim, when he did what Kushan Rishasayim did. Or that's what the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin says. Or the Yerushalmi says, he did two wicked things, a little bit different. He violated the oath. Because we know in Parshas Vayetze that Yaakov and Lavan made a peace treaty not to, that their descendants should ever hurt each other. So he violated the oath. That was, uh, uh, you could say, it's Bilaam, when Bilaam crossed over to curse the Jewish people. And one of them also that he enslaved the Jews for eight years. So that, that's the same thing. And that's what, uh, if you look in the Targum, when they discuss Kushan Rishasayim, what does it say? The Jews served Kushan Chayova. Kushan Chayova. Chayova means a person who is Chay, a person who is a Russia. So it's, he's a double Russia. He's a double Russia. So uh, certainly these three people were no friends of the Jews. He's about following the footsteps. Lavan, Bilam, Bilam's father, Baor, and, and Kushan Rishasayim. So therefore, that already is, is fitting in. Who, who was our first enemy? Our first enemy? Who was the first enemy who tried to destroy the Jews? It was, was Lavan. It was Lavan. It was the first one. So now we go back to the first one. Sort of, it's reminded of, it says in the Haggadah, Mitchila of the Avodah Zara. Our, father, our fathers were of the Avodah Zara. Right? Our, our roots as Jews are pagan roots. Who is that? That was Terach. 
Terach who lived in Aram Narayim. So it's, it's Hashem is subtly reminding us if you're going back to those old ways of Aram Narayim, where did idol worship begin with the Jewish people? Our father, Avram's father, Terach, was an idol worshiper. We say the Nagoda. And you should thank Hashem, right? And, but, and then, you know, we have really terrible roots, but look what Hashem did to make things better. And uh, we're forgetting we're not supposed to be idol worshippers. So now, in the very place where we began to be idol worshippers, which is in Aram Naraim, so from Aram Naraim, Hashem is going to punish you. You understand? So that's, it's not Stami just picked any Joe out of the hat. You're going back to the way you started off, you know, your humble beginnings, you were all idol worshippers. So now, you know, and Avram changed the tide and slowly, slowly you became people who got the Torah at Sinai. So what are you doing going back to those old roots of idol worship? So I'll have the one who wanted to destroy you through idol worship then, will try to destroy you now. That's how it comes back. Now it's very interesting, the Ben Yehoyada, the Sephardic commentary in Sanhedrin, so if you take a look at these three guys, all right, Kushan Rishasayim starts with the letter Chaf, Lavan starts with a Lamed, and Boar starts with a base. get the word Kelev, a dog. Okay, so that's, you know, so like barking dogs. That's what they really were. They were barking dogs. They wanted to hurt the Jews. So it's interesting, if you look at the Gemara, look at the order, look at the order of the Gemara. Now, you figure any order should have been picked, should have been a chronological order. It should have said, Lavan is the same guy as Boor, is the same guy as Kushan Rishasayim. Doesn't say that. It says Boor, Boor, which is the second, is Kushan Rishasayim, which is the third, who is Lavan, which is the first. So why is the Gemara doing that? So the Ben Yudah says, because you get a different first letters this way. If you start with Boor, you get a base. Kushan Rishasayim, you get a Chaf. And then we get a Lama, it spells the word Bakol. Bakol. Kelev, one way. Bakol, the other way. What's the difference? Bakol, Hashem Beirach as Avram Bakol. Hashem blessed Avram with everything. And what does it mean he blessed him with everything? That Avram had everything he needed in life. He was happy with everything he had. Contentment. That's what Avram brought to the world, the idea of contentment. Why? Because he was doing what his purpose in life was. The person can say, you know, I, I, who, who can say I'm blessed with everything? Only one person can say I'm blessed with everything. He who has everything. Who, could, who has everything? Nobody has everything. The more it says, whoever has 100 wants 200. Whoever has 200 wants 400. How could, no one's ever happy in this world. Nobody leaves this planet without even half of what they want in this world. How did Avram get out of that by being content? Because he, he achieved his purpose. He understood what his purpose was, and he was working and living for that purpose. So if he had everything. So that power of Avram was that very power that would contend with the caliph. Would fight against that, those people, and it was in that merit that the Jews survived. So there we see where our old nemesis comes from, and that's why it comes from an outside source. Okay, so that's where it's at, and they're, and they're in trouble for eight years. So he's saying, he's saying in, in a positive way, in other words, he's saying that when we went back to Aram and Aram, not as a punishment, but because Hashem went wanted back. us to remember, so we went back to be serving the... the, the because the, we're being punished. But, but now we're being time, punished. But at the same time, it sounds like he's saying, that the Sephardic commentary is saying that we, that Hashem wanted to remind us that we have within us Abraham, and we can fight this. Yeah, you fight it with that power, power which, which hopefully we're going to see the next Pasuk happen. Yeah. But that's how you have to fight it. But that's why the order was switched. Well, why would you switch order? Go in chronological order. It doesn't. Rather, it's the Kelev. Kelev, in other words, Kushan Risha Saim, who's the Kaf, he manifested two earlier generations, Lavan and Baor. So, Tess. By Yisaku b'nei Yisrael Hashem, so after eight years, they cry out to Hashem. They're praying to Hashem, and the Malbim suggests, you know, uh, others suggest, not the Malbim here, but uh, that that they're doing tshuva, doing some kind of tshuva. The fact you cry out to Hashem, that itself is is a first level of tshuva. 
because you're saying, Hashem, please help us. We don't like what's going on. So you start turning to Hashem. So by Yochum Hashem, Moshia Livnei Yisrael, Hashem establishes a savior for the Jewish people by Yoshiaim and he saves them. There's a double expression there that the Malbim will deal with shortly. It's just to say, because you'll see, go throughout Sefer Shoftim, some Shoftim will get one expression of being a savior and some get two expressions of being a savior. So here the very first one has a double expression. Hashem brings up a Moshia, a savior, by Yoshiyim, and he saves them. We'll see in a minute why. Who is this person? Who would be the first savior of the Jewish people? Who's such a big tzaddik? Esos Neil ben Kenaz. Asniel, the son of Knaz, Achi Kolev HaKoton Mimenu, the younger brother of Kolev. Yes, that Asniel ben Kenaz who built the yeshiva, who was able to destroy, to, to, to destroy the, the, um, the, the, the city of Kiryas Sefer because he was able to bring back the 3,000 laws of Torah. He built the yeshiva in the desert. Right, also his son, his, his step-brother, his step-brother and son-in-law, okay? And we already described this Neil to you earlier in the Sefer. He was an amazing tzaddik. So this would be the savior of the Jewish people. Asniel ben Kenaz would be this savior. So, and, and, and the double expressions over here is that there's many ways you can, you can save people. You can save them militarily. Some some of the Shoftim were great military leaders. And for that alone, that brought a lot of relief to the Jewish people. He was a savior in a military way. He could also be a savior in a spiritual way. So Asniel ben Kenaz was a double savior. He was able to save them militarily. And he was able to save them spiritually. And we'll see in a minute exactly how. So Hashem brings this fellow. And what happens? Pasuk Yud. Vatihi alav ruach Hashem. And the spirit of Hashem came over him. Vayishpot es Yisrael. And he judged over the Jewish people. Vayetzel Mocham. He went out to battle. So three things going on over here. There was a spirit of Hashem came over him. He judged the Jewish people. And he went out to battle. So what's the spirit of Hashem? So Targum says what? Ruach Nevoah. It was prophecy. Prophecy came over him. The Malbim says, it can be, it can, it can all be correct. He says, a ruach, a spirit of justice and gvura, control, to be able to be the right type of shofet and to bring them back to the ways of Hashem. You need a spirit of Hashem to be able to do what? To vayishpot es Yisrael. To give the Jews the balance that they once again needed. He was able to do that. Number one, and number two, and when they did do tshuva properly, then what happens? They would go out to war, and they'd be victorious in war. And that's what he says afterwards. Vayiten Hashem biyodas kushem rishosai melcharam. Hashem hands over to him. What, what does it not say? It, it didn't say he went out, um, and he had, and there was all kinds of uh, real battles going on, and all kinds of difficult battles and and all these things. It was, yeah, and Hashem handed him over. He, he, hand, he handed him over to him. It says, even though it says, it says they went out to battle, but it doesn't say, they fought with him. But it, as soon as he goes out, he just went out to battle, Hashem gave him over in his hands. So, because Asniel, I don't think, learned military strategies. From the old school, the old school. You just pray to God, say some mystical incantations, whoop around the sword, and then you kill them. Because that's what he's saying. He, he put them in his hand. You'll see, you'll always see the contrasts when, when a tzaddik is involved where, where you don't have to do that much and uh, where, as opposed to others where they're not such big tzaddikim and you gotta do a lot more physical exertion over here. So it's just, he, he just goes out to battle, and, and that's it. And he's just given into his hand. But it wasn't just that, but it was it, it, it continuously. And his hand became very strong. Al Kushan Rishasayim. 
to such an extent that what did that cause for us to get olive? The land was quiet for 40 years. It was quiet. Again, as opposed to others where it didn't turn out that way exactly. We'll see the other show of team where there was still lots of contention going on. But this was a, the ultimate tzaddik brought the ultimate salvation. The ultimate salvation because he brought the Jews back. They did tshuva. They were worthy. They were going to battle. It was m m a miraculous like type of victory. And now the issue with the 40 years, all the commentaries tell us, all the commentaries tell us, it, that includes the eight years of servitude. That includes. It includes because if you figure out the years, it just doesn't figure out. If you're going to add the times that they were the shofate and add onto that the times of servitude, the numbers don't work out. So how can that be? So, so that's an interesting question. So, so how can you say that it was um, it was quiet? It's difficult, difficult shot. Only thing we can possibly say is, we know, for example, when someone is about tshuva, person does tshuva, it says. Zdonos nasios kizchuyot. When you do tshuva out of love, then all the premeditated sins you did turn into virtues. There's a retroactive rectification, which needs a lot of explanation. I don't have time to tell you right now, but in other words, whatever you did bad in your lifetime, you know, when you do tshuva, it's not like we just erase the past and there's no past anymore. Whatever, whatever happened to you is part of your life and it's something that's got to be incorporated into your go forward position. So therefore, even the bad things you did, there's a way to bring it out and that good should ultimately come out of them. The same is sort of Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan was a Makar of Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish was a highwayman, was a robber. He became a Tan in the Gemara. And then when it came time to discuss certain laws, of Jewish law relating to ritual purity and impurity, over certain items, who is the expert in, in, in weaponry? To know what's the halachic status of weaponry? Obviously a guy who was a highwayman. He understood weapons better than the other rabbis. So he could tell us the halachas of weaponry. So that he took his evil past and he made it into a positive thing right now. So, you, so, it, so in other words, sometimes the past, when it gets fixed up, then you come to recognize Hashem even more. And shakta, you know, means means at ease, meaning we were spiritually at ease. So so sometimes the eight years of turbulence, in retrospect, you can realize how much ease it brings you now in the next 32 years. So it kind of gets all's well that ends well sort of thing, where, where the eight years of turbulence, really only through that turbulence could we have the comfort that we have now. And a lot of Baal Shubas, you know, I appreciate my life so much more now because my life was so terrible before. If you, if, you didn't, if you didn't have such a terrible life before, you wouldn't have been about Shuvah today. So sometimes the terrible part, that's part of what makes it good. Okay, we'll talk more about Asnil ben Kenaz tomorrow and a few other uh, items that happened in his life.